And if you look at the red arrow initially, or the green arrow initially, that's male team sports. And you see the participation increase is lovely, and yes, at 14 or 15 you have drop-off. You look at the green one, or the red one, and you start to have a bit of a problem. I'm obviously colorblind. Um, you look at the red one and you see the problem for girls. Right? Participation never gets that high initially, but look what happens as they get older. It practically disappears. It goes really low. Participation in team sports among girls decreases quite worryingly. And some of that drop-off is, is kind of unavoidable. Um, I don't know, unless maybe Mary O'Connor probably tried it, but you can't play camogie in team sports when you get into your 40s and 50s. Sorry, Mary, I'm only joking. But you can keep going and keep excelling um, to a certain stage, but there comes a point when um, it has to drop off. Right? It's unavoidable to a certain extent, but it's too stark. And what, what caused a bit of consternation at the time is if you look at the other two um, lines on the graph, the ones that I didn't pick out as such, they're individual sports. And what do you see there? It doesn't drop off quite as much. And that caused an awful lot of controversy about three or four years ago because the, the output of that was that why are we putting all our money and energy into team sports when the individual's sports seem to catch our attention for a little bit longer? And it did cause a little bit of, of trouble, but I think when we look behind that, we found that participation in team sports and in GA are, is, still, is still really high. But what's happening is that some other sports are becoming a little bit more popular. Right? And that's something that I don't think is something to be worried about. I think it's a challenge. And, you know, in reality, in, in GA specifically, we do really well at the first bit at recruiting players to our sports. We are at this fulcrum and centre of so many families. You think of your Fenleys and your Brogans and your Jacobs and lots of others. You all know ones in your own clubs and in your own counties. We also have that club and that community thing that's stronger than any other sport. Uh, Sean O'Gahalping talked about when he came uh, to Ireland from Fiji and how the Napirchik was a community and it welcomed him into that particular place and hurling was the thing that did that for him. So we do really well there. We're well able to recruit players. So if you look at Jan Cote's, and he was speaking this morning, his description of youth sport, that's the first phase of getting kids involved. And we don't have a problem there. We also do OK at the 10 and 11 age group. We can keep them involved. Some of them, yes, will love it and they like the competition, but we also have that recreation element. If you think of go games and how important that is now, that's kind of looked after for itself. But what happens then, at the 14 or 15, when you have to decide, am I going to make a career out of this? Am I going to become excellent? Am I going to stay involved? And that's that critical age group. And just, I know that's kind of not specific to GA, but I actually did a little survey on our WIT students. And I got 50 or 60, not a huge number or anything, but I asked them just three questions. Did you play sport when you were a child? And I gave them an age range. Do you still play, not sport, GA. Do you still, still play GA? Um, if not, what age did you drop out? And if not, why did you drop out? And look what I got, okay? It, it's coincidental, but I didn't make it up, I promise. About 86% 80 played when they were young, right, the 10, 11 age group. How many of them still play now as a student, or aged between 18 and 21? We're down to 38%. So it, it is real. That's, those, those numbers are real. And what was the average dropout age? Well, it's your 15 age group again, which is very much in line with those slides that I showed you a second ago. So that is your average dropout age. And I actually spoke to a club in Waterford, quite a good club, and I uh, just had a little chat with one of the members of that club who's heavily involved in UGA, and I was trying to probe that particular age group. And he said that what happens in their club is that at under 14, they do really well, okay, and they tend to be successful, and they have lots of players. And what happens then between under 14 and under 15 is that the guys who are subs, or the girls who are subs in under 14, they go away, they're sick of it, they don't want to play anymore. There's something that's missing there. They're not coming back to that subsequent age group. All right. He actually cited the fact that the under-15 competition probably isn't good enough, not strong enough, and at that stage they begin to lose them. All right. So there's something to think about. But on the next slide then, I asked the students as well, why did they drop out? And as I said earlier, some of it's unavoidable. Uh, some students or some individuals, some kids, they just like another sport better. Um, another um, individual that I spoke to mentioned the role of family, and they said if their family isn't really into GAA, they don't push it enough, they don't support it enough perhaps, and that's fine. We can't take over the whole world or the whole country, so we can accept that. Um, but the other little things, and the ones in red particularly, the ones that we're going to focus on a little bit, the GAA isn't a priority, there's something else. 
And those distractions that I was talking about, uh, be it video games, be it TV, uh, be it hanging out with their friends and loads of other things that I'm sure you're much more aware of, it, GA just isn't near the top of the list anymore. Hurling, Camogie, Gaelic Sports, whatever one it is. Also, they have very little interest or motivation in staying playing, and about 70% of them picked that one. And then in the last one, 60% of them said it was due to pure coaching or management. And if you bring that back to the motivation slide that I was talking about a few minutes ago, the role of the coach and the manager is so important there in that interaction, in facilitating that interaction between the participa participant and situational factors. And they can see that. The students and the kids, they actually see that. It's important to them from that age group that you're a good coach and that you're in charge and that you're facilitating that interaction between all these different factors. And so that's what we want to do today. We want to speak to you as coaches and people involved in youth sport and to perhaps make you think beyond having good drills and make you think beyond knowing as much as you can about camogie or about hurling or football, whatever it might be, that perhaps you might appreciate the sports psychology or maybe, yes, you appreciate it, but give you some actual practical skills to use and take back to your own club. And um, in the next one there, I, I spoke to, just to kind of re-emphasize what we just said, this is from one of the Camogie development officers, uh, she'll remain nameless, but if, if you read that particular one, it just reinforces what I've been saying. So I think again, it's just telling us that the role of the coach is really important. Right? Um, we give up our time and we give a lot of effort to this particular position, but there's more things that we can do as well. So what we feel is to overcome some of those issues of dropout and, and lack of motivation, that perhaps we can appreciate and use some principles from uh, sports psychology. And here's the fun part. You're having a great conference here today and you're being bombarded, I'm sure, with lots of new ideas and different information and equipment to buy and stuff to do. And sometimes I think as a coach, it can become a little overwhelming how much a coach is expected to do these days. And in terms of player motivation and keeping people involved in the game and building a team and building cohesion, I hope for you that a lot of this doesn't take away from the fun of actually getting between the white lines and, and doing your thing for an hour and a half and really enjoying it and really having fun. But what this is about, the next part of this, is really to try to look at how you can help player motivation and help build a cohesive team. And the idea behind a cohesive team is if it's cohesive, people will want to come and be there. If it's not cohesive, and I'm sure loads, loads of people here have been involved in teams where there were issues and it wasn't that great and you know, it wasn't the best place to be all the time, and particularly if you're not winning or you're, you're not achieving your goals, it can be a not so nice place. But if we can make it a good place, then maybe kids will want to come there and they'll want to spend time training and practicing and enjoying the sport because the payback for them from the cohesion, from being part of a group, um, can be really worthwhile. Uh, what I'm going to do is really try to jump through a few things and give you some things that you can do with your team in the first two, three weeks of the season. And that's coming for most people. Um, that's coming soon now over the next few, few weeks. So hopefully you leave with a couple of ideas about how you can approach the start of the season in terms of improving motivation and team cohesion. Um, the classic model of team cohesion is what's called the linear model and goes through four stages. The, the forming of the team, the storming when different things go wrong, the norming when people start to come back together again and solve the issues, and then the performing when they get out there and they play and they're successful and you achieve your goals. We're going to focus on just the first stage because that's what you can practically get involved in over the next few weeks. But very quickly, we'll take you through the four different stages so that you have an overview of the whole lot. The forming stage is the coming together. Um, mostly people, look, every team starts afresh every year, but not every team is rebuilt every year. Some teams are built over two, three, four, five years, but every season you come back, there is a period where people are trying to work out what's it going to be like this year, who do we have, how hard are we going to train, is it a new coach, what are the demands, what's the competition, etc., etc. So there's that period, and your role as a coach here is about giving their directions about what you're going to do, about teaching skills, developing tactics. It's also about encouraging them to, to put 
everything that they can into, into training into this team this year. But it's also about clarifying what their priorities are, where camogie or, or hurling or football fits in in their life, what their roles are on the team, and what type of goals and what type of mindset they're going to have. And what's in red there is what we're going to primarily look at, what you might be able to do with your team in the next couple of months. Um, also, sorry, just back. It's also a good idea at the start of, of the season. You do need to get to know the players, but it's probably a good idea not to befriend them because you're going to have to make some decisions pretty soon about who plays and who's the sub and what different roles are. And it's best that you're just on you know, a friendly basis but not so close that they have expectations that you like them or you know, things can get a little muddled there early on. In the second stage, when things have been going for a while, teams are going to have issues. Now, not every team will experience the storming stage. Okay? It's, not, it's not a given that this follows the theory. Every team is different. But it's quite likely that there will be some issues about who plays, who plays in what position, about what the coach does, about how players are treated, people being late for practice, punishments, sanctions, people who don't turn up for training get to play. You know all the issues, right? Yeah? You're familiar with all those things. They're eventually going to lead to some conflict within the team. This is something that you, as a coach, need to expect. And when it happens, you need to embrace it because it's a natural part of the development of a team. And it's not a, what was the first team you ever played on? Can you think of that? Or the very first team you were on, forget play, take out the play word. The very first team you were ever on was your family. And your family came together, and as your family developed, grew, got older, kids got older, etc., etc., there were problems, there were arguments, there were issues. But most families sort them out and move on to the next stage. And that's not any different from the team situation. This is where you will develop most as a coach in terms of dealing with these issues. It won't be that difficult at under 14, 15, 16, but as they get to the dropout age that Aoife spoke about, then this, these become bigger issues for players. And in our society today, there's a huge emphasis on individual achievement. And one of the reasons I suspect there isn't such a big dropout in individual sports is individual achievement in individual sports is not affected by other people. But individual achievement in team sports is affected by other people. And we, we often tell our players on teams that I'm involved with, you have to do this even if you don't like it because you're messing with his dreams. He's got a dream, he's got a goals he wants to achieve. But for him to achieve those, he's dependent on other people to do their bit as well. That doesn't happen in individual sports. So team sports brings this with it as a part of the process of, of, a, of a team developing. And you become a better coach when you have to deal with this stage. The third stage, this is a nice bit because the storming stage is over. We've resolved a few conflicts. People have accepted the outcome, and now we get down to building a little bit of camaraderie and team spirit and team bonding. Now, I, I, would, suggest, I would suggest that you think very often at the beginning of a season, at the, at the forming stage, people talk a lot about team bonding. But the real bonding will only occur a little further down the line. Real team bonding will occur after you've played some games and you've dealt with success and you've dealt with failure. Or you've dealt with winning or you've dealt with losing. Or you've dealt with people being happy with how things are going and people being unhappy about things, how things are going. That's when the real bonding will, will develop. So whitewater rafting or climbing bridges or rope courses can be great fun for people getting to know each other but I'm not 100% sure that transfers into a team playing together better uh, on the field. I think that happens a little more when other issues have been sorted. And the final stage, which is where we really want to get to, is the performing stage. This is where the team's about getting the job done, which is about performing the way you like to perform, trying to fulfill your potential, trying to achieve your goals, trying to play together as a team. And here, maybe the players are getting to decide more things. Maybe the players are developing the ability to make some decisions themselves. And you, as a coach, 
your role changes. Now those four stages can happen in one year, but they're probably more likely to happen over two or three years. And if we look at the next slide, I mean, I would suggest to you here that it takes pr approximately three years to build a team, to go through all those stages, to have players have all the experiences of success and failure, of, of being an impact player and being a role player. On the, the slide that Aoife spoke about in terms of dropouts, what percentage of the people who dropped out of team sports would you say were predominantly substitutes? Probably most of them. And that's only logical, isn't it? It's only natural if you're not playing and you don't feel you're as important a part of the team as other people, you'll find something else to do. And we want to keep those people involved in sport, so we have to have a method of doing that. And if it hasn't been working up to now, it's probably a good idea to look at a new method. But it can take three years to really build a team. It can, it can take about three weeks to destroy one. That's the, especially as you move into the adult level. It can come apart very, very quickly. But the building process is the fun part. Um, how many seasons would it take you as a coach to become more skilled at any one of those four stages? Rhetorical question. Okay. How many seasons would it take you as a coach to become skilled at all four of the stages of dealing with the issues, the motivation factors, keeping the team together, uh, getting people to move from being role players to being impact players, getting substitutes to stay involved in the game, to work harder despite maybe not getting to play as much so that they get to play more. Because that's the only way you can play more is if you work harder. There, there is really no other way. So in terms of that, I, I, before we move on to the next, but I'd also like to throw out the concept that you know, the number of years somebody's coaching isn't necessarily the number of years of experience that they have. Somebody can be coaching for 10 years, they have 10 years experience, but that could be one year's experience repeated 10 times. So learning to do something new, learning to do something different every season can be a really good way of you developing as a coach and you increasing the number of skills that you bring to the team and consequently, consequently the players becoming more motivated because you've got more to give and they see things developing in a much more positive and productive light for the team in the long term. Now, the next slide, there's a range of different things that, that you can do. Today we're looking at player and, and maybe the management, if it's a county team, priorities. We're looking at their roles and we're looking at the type of mindset that you want to develop. The, working on the communication within a team is something that you can obviously do as well. And working on the, 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 being aware of the different stages the team is going through in terms of its development and maybe making sure that once you have things in place that you don't allow them to slip. They're all things that I think every coach here can probably do, whether you're coaching under 16s or minor teams or county teams in, in the foreseeable future. The things on the other side might take a bit more time. You know, a proper behavior analysis of a team is probably something you can only do with a, a senior inter-county team to find out really what are the behavior types on the team and how do they interact with each other and how should I manage them. That's maybe a different kettle of fish. Setting and monitoring goals is something that you should certainly try to do, but it's time consuming, but it's definitely worth doing. Dealing with issues immediately is a coaching skill that needs to be developed. And I, I know for me, sometimes when, when you're coaching, you say, uh-oh, that's not good. But you don't deal with it because you hope the next night it'll be okay. And then maybe the next night you don't deal with it because you're still hoping it'll be okay. And if it's gotten worse, now you've got a bigger issue to deal with. Where it's something as simple as being late for training consistently, or whether it's the wrong attitude with officials, or whether it's the wrong attitude with other players, Deal with things immediately because players like that. Players like to know that the person that's in charge is in charge. And then reinforcing performance, mindset, and effort correctly. Knowing that your skills of praising, criticizing, sanctioning behavior, sanctioning poor play, that that's done correctly. 
And that can be a very, very difficult, that's probably the most difficult coaching skill there is out there. Because I can say, great game today. And if I say nothing to the next guy, have I been critical of him? Yes, I have. If there are two players together and I tell one he's played great and I say nothing to the other, I've just criticized one player. And he knows that. So that's very difficult, how we communicate and how we reinforce. Now, to go back to what we were going to work at, the forming stage. This is a really important stage. And I'm going to suggest like a, a, a technique, if you want to call it that, uh, that you can use when you begin to get your team together uh, in February or, or early March or whenever. Um, you see in this slip here, it decides that some teams seem to resent the fact that trainers just expect Komogi to come before everything else. Okay? That might not be true of everybody, but there's more people here than we expected. So some of you have a slip of paper that was on the chair when you came in with a list of player priorities on it. If you don't have one of those, what I'd like you to do is just revert back to when you were 15. Okay? And if you can't remember when you were 15, 16 will do. What I'd like you to do is very quickly, very quickly, because this is something you might ask your players to do. So I'm, you're, 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 you're not getting any more than a minute to do this. I want you to write down, in order of importance, the priorities in your life. In your life now, not just in sport. Okay? And I want you to try to get to seven of them. Okay? Very quickly. The first two, your wife is number one anyway. I just to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. First seven, as quick as you can. The other one is number two, yeah. Now, you get your players in. How do... How do you go about knowing who your players are? How do, you go, how do you go about finding out about them? Okay, if you're in a small club or if you're in a community, you might know a lot of them. You might be teaching some in school. You meet them different days. But how do you know about what their priorities are? And if you've got a list of priorities down there now, where is sport in that list of priorities? And we just did a couple of samples here. And here, Komogi's number three. So family, school, friends, socializing, holidays are in there with Komogi. In terms of coaching this player, you're going to have a very different experience from this player here. Because Karen, Komogi's number six. Now, that's their priorities. What we can't do as coaches is we can't expect the kids to have our priorities. Your priority might be, okay, family, number one, can live with that, Komogi's got to be number two, or football's got to be number two, or whatever. But it's their priorities. Now, you take 25 or 24 or 30 players or whatever you have with lots of different priorities, then people are coming to the table with a lot of different issues that are going to impact on how hard they train, how often they train, how they develop, how motivated they are to get better. Because Karen's motivation here might be very, very different to Anne's motivation. We can try to encourage more motivation from both of them, from Karen in particular, but if these priorities as, as they are, that's going to be difficult. So how you deal with those players is going to be different. So what's your cutoff point here? Now here's a, here's a coaching decision in the very, very start of the season. For, for your team, for your club, for the goals that your club have, your, your club expect, etc., etc. where's the cutoff point that Komogi must be in the top four, top three, Top five, you have to decide that because this can determine everything that happens for the rest of the year. Okay, if we look at the next slide, wherever you decide the cutoff is, that's going to determine how you react to, how you deal, how you plan, how you prepare for the rest of the, for the, rest of the year. Now, 
as Aoife said, the cutoff point's going to be different for different age groups, for different situations. But I firmly believe that the players have to know what the cutoff point is. And if you have, if you accept that, let's say, for example, sorry, if you accept that maybe for this team, the cutoff point here has to be number four. You expect Kamogi to be in the top four, but a player says, well, actually, football is number four for me, Kamogi is number five. Now, you're, if you remember back to the model of motivation, there's player factors, there's situation factors, and how they interact. That interaction there is going to be something that you're going to have to be conscious of in relation to other players. Because as coaches, we very often say things like, if you're not at practice, if you're not at training, you won't get to play. Do you, have you heard that? And do people not come and play? They do. So straight away, your credibility is chipped away at a little bit. And I think when Aoife said, you know, when, uh, when you ask college students, uh, why did they, what, were, what were the reasons for dropping out? And 60% said, well, you know, poor coaching management uh, was one of the reasons. I, I don't believe they're actually saying the coaches were bad coaches. I don't believe that. What I do believe they're saying is coaches and managers said things and then didn't stand by them. Because that's something that we teach in school at a very early age, that you, your word is supposed to be important. What you say is something that you're supposed to do. And there's a particular attitude that's necessary for sport to be an interesting, um, fruitful experience for, for the people who take part. So, decide your cutoff and then look at what is the kind of mindset or the kind of attitude. Now, mindset is the, the current hip word to use here, but we're really talking about attitude. Um, what is the kind of mindset and attitude that you now want your players to display and what kind of roles and goals you're going to develop for them? Because once you've decided what your priorities are, your next job is to make sure that everybody in the team has got a role and that they know what that role is. Now, before you can develop the role, you may need to change or try to change some aspect of their mindset and their, their attitude. I would suggest that there's three things as a coach you are. You're first of all an instructor. You teach skills. You show them how to hold a hurley. You show them how to strike a ball. You show them how to pick a ball up. Okay, they're instructional skills. You also teach, like you're looking at the games-based model. You teach the games-based model. You teach ideas about attacking, ideas about defending. But what you coach, what you coach is the interaction between players and interaction between players on the field and off the field. Coaching involves changing. Coaching involves bringing about change in players. And sometimes this is one of the first things that has to be changed in order for motivation and in order for performance to improve. Where would you start? Because attitude is made up of feelings, beliefs, and behaviors. Which one would you try to change first? What determines behavior? What determines your feelings? If I believe that sunshine is good and it's raining today, Am I going to feel sad? My, my beliefs determine an awful lot. So changing the player's belief about their role on the team, about how they play, how about how is you, you as a team will train and play, that's the first issue you're going to have to tackle, is what they believe. Their priorities, maybe you want to change those a little bit. Maybe you want to move Camogie from number seven to number six. Maybe in one of our individuals there, you want to move it from number one down to number two so she's a more balanced individual. <laughs> but in order to make that change, you're going to have to try to help change their beliefs about what they do. And with that comes self-confidence, um, which is kind of important for them. Uh-uh. Sorry. So once, once you're set in the mindset, now you, now you have to determine what their role is. Without a role on the team, then a player doesn't really, really understand what they have to do. It's very straightforward, maybe, the role of the full back is. 
but clarify for them what the role of the fullback is and clarify for them what their role outside of just playing is. What's their role in terms of what they bring to the team? This can be very difficult with the substitutes because what's the substitute's role? Okay, if I get, if I'm asked to come on in a certain position, come on and do a job there. Do you accept that role? If they say, yeah, I love being a sub, and I'm quite happy with that, and we'd all love to have a player like that, but probably they don't. They say, no, I want to start. I want to play more. And you're the person who's stopping me from playing because it's your decision as the coach. So we can give them a kind of airy, fairy, vague, ambiguous reason. Oh, look, you're really going well, and I can see you're coming on if you keep working hard, but in your mind you're going, there isn't a chance of me starting them ahead of Sheila so long as Sheila is fit. So what is their role on the team? What makes it worthwhile for them to be there? I, I think as coaches, we have responsibilities to clarify the roles for every player on the team and see and talk to them to find out, do they understand their role? Do they accept their role? Because if I don't accept my role, sooner or later, I'm going to be a little bit unhappy about what's going on, particularly if we're not being uh, successful. Um, it's very important when you play the best teams that everybody knows what their role is and they accept their role, especially when you play the very, very good teams, the more talented teams. There's two types of mindset they can have. A growth mindset, which involves looking out for new challenges, welcoming change on the team, welcoming a new role on the team, accepting a role that a coach might want to have. Um, being very goal oriented having specific things that you want to achieve, and perhaps maybe dealing with setbacks, dealing with losses, dealing with failure, having the ability to cope and deal with those and refocus and, and get going again. A fixed mindset, don't like change. Players coming back this year that you'll deal with in a couple of weeks might want things to be exactly like they were last year. Maybe you weren't that successful last year, but four or five players had a great year. They played every game. Um, they were the stars. They were the key players. They got a lot of something out of the season, but the team wasn't successful. Are there things that you need to change in your team? And are there players who won't want things changed? So you're going to have to look at the mindset. Fixed mindsets like to avoid challenges. There are players... I, I always find it really strange. At the start of every season, the majority of teams in any competition know they're not going to win the championship. I don't know if you'd agree with that. Next year's All-Ireland, the majority of teams in the country will know right from the start, from, from this month, that they're not going to win the All-Ireland. There'll be two or three or four teams that know that they can. So what do all those other teams do for the year? Go through the motions? Or actually try to change their mindset and take on a challenge and find out just how far they can go this year and next year and next year and build and build on that. To do that, people have to have a growth mindset. The fixed mindset, they may not know their role, and even if they do know their role, they may not be happy to fulfill that role. Um, fixed mindsets like to, like to keep things vague. You know, how are you doing? Uh, okay, how's training going? Uh, all right but there's no specifics. Uh, growth mindsets will want to talk about details, will ask questions about getting better. Fixed mindsets won't ever talk about how you improve. And players with fixed mindsets, after setbacks, after losses, after poor performances, they don't deal with them that well. Mostly they try to avoid giving as much effort in the future. So if you've, if you've had the experience with a team, as I have, and I'm sure a lot of people have, that we're not playing as well as we should or, or could, but we don't seem to be giving any more effort to improving our performance, then that may be because the attitude is one of avoiding failure rather than trying to achieve success. Um, to put it in context, you know, attitude has the power to really build a team up or tear it down. And teams that are being built up, I, I, I believe most players want to be a part of and are motivated to be a part of and enjoy co coming to that, that situation. Teams that are not doing that, teams that are 
being torn apart, and I don't mean that in a very dramatic way, but teams that are, are just not great places to be around, um, attitude is a key factor there too. And great talent with bad attitudes will always be a bad team. It'll take great talent with good attitudes to have a great team. Talent can be consistent right throughout, but mindset or attitude can be a determining factor in what type of team that is to be involved in and how successful that team can be. Okay, um, next one. So once you've established what the priorities are, and yes, you can ask all your players to write down their priorities in life, to ask everybody to see where is Komogi in their list of priorities, and then based on how important it is to that particular team that year, you can go about setting uh, what individual players' roles are and know what their goals are. And I'm looking in your, your player pathway, one of the things that's in the mental capacities in your player pathway is setting and maintaining good goals throughout the season. So this is very, very important that you set them, and we're not going to go through what they are. But the key thing, and I think a lot of times as coaches we come along and say, you know, you have to have goals, you have to make sure that you have good goals to work towards. But do you know what they are? Do other players on the team know what other players' goals are? And then who monitors them? Because if they're not monitored, if they're not measured, they won't get done. Nothing gets done if it's not measured in, in sport. So goal setting is a final step in terms of that part of forming your team for the season. Um, what are the individual goals? What are the team goals that you require? And when are we going to check them? When are we going to sit down as a group and say, Mary, you know, have you achieved your goals in January? Well, no, I haven't. Well, now why? And lead that into roles, lead that into priorities, and see what kind of a, a picture emerges from your team. And then finally, I, I suppose the reality, Aoife, maybe yeah, want, want to like finish up on that. And I want to list, and I ask them, well, how does this actually work? What do we bring back to our clubs? If you think of the youth sport team again, because it, it, it's brilliant, and I'm fascinated by it. And, um, so I said, well, if I have 100 times or 100 trials, can I do any of this? Does it apply at all? And he said, well, it's really important with under 10s and under 12 to get to know them and who they are and um, how important Charlie or Kamogi is to them. And then when they're under 14 or 16, that's critical age. But you can actually do that task um, that we just gave out to you there today. So perhaps to bring it home and to try it. And I think the other thing he said was, you can do this with any team. But it doesn't matter, you can go home now to this new team that you've taken over and start trying to develop those four stages that Jerry went through. And it's, the other critical thing is, I think this has to be a whole club or county philosophy. And that whole club approach, um, that club in Waterford, Bally Gunner, they do it really well. They're the same person mentoring an under 18 right up to under 21. So they have that consistency, the same message as they go through the club. And it works for them, so I guess that's why it's good. But again, something that you perhaps can apply to your clubs and also to your county. So that's it, last game that you're reminded. Sorry, can I just, just, sorry, sorry, just one, just one, finally, we obviously trying to coordinate this all week, right? Um, just to leave you kind of a finishing, finishing thought on it, um, I, I'm, I'm always fascinated by, you know, by just words, because you hear the same words used around teams an awful lot, and teamwork, um, very often we take it for granted that once we have a group of players together and they train, we'll have teamwork. But I would just put it to you that teamwork is a very, very elusive, very frustrating commodity that you want to try to develop. Um, and if you approach it from that point of view, how am I going to develop teamwork? How am I going to nurture it? Where is it going to come from? It's a very different approach to just making an assumption that we're back, we're training, we should have teamwork. It's a given. It's not, it's a commodity and it's very elusive and frustrating. So spend some time working on it because the payback is enormous. Thank you.